It's really special to be able to welcome our next guest to the stage. Although it may be the first time many of you have met Dr. Rigsby, he's actually a longtime friend of AQHYA, and we're really excited to have him back today. Dr. Rick Rigsby is president and CEO of Rick Rigsby Communications. Through motivational speaking, corporate coaching, books, and social media outlets, he encourages and empowers audience members to become great people who do great things. The San Francisco native is a former award-winning journalist who followed a television news career with six years of graduate school, culminating with a PhD from the University of Oregon. A college professor for two decades, Dr. Rigsby spent most of those years at Texas A&M University. Can I get a gigum? Yeah. <laughs> where he also served as a character coach and chaplain for the Aggies football team. Dr. Rigsby now devotes his full attention to empowering people worldwide, from presenting leadership principles in Nigeria to speaking to Fortune 500 companies in the Americas, Europe, and Canada. In high demand among educational, business, and service organizations, and a favorite among professional sports organizations, including the NFL and the PGA, he offers common sense wisdom to those desiring to rise to greater levels of excellence. Throughout his three decades in broadcasting and academics, Dr. Rigsby has received numerous commendations and awards, including being named a two-time recipient of the prestigious Outstanding Teacher Award by Texas A&M University's College of Liberal Arts. In addition to ac academic publications, Dr. Rigsby is the author of Lessons from a Third Grade Dropout, the story of timeless common sense wisdom learned from his father. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Rick Rigsby. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Brock. Good morning, everyone. That's not good enough. Good morning, everyone. There you go. How y'all doing? Y'all are beautiful. You really are. Even the guys, you're good looking guys. And I am so thrilled to be here with you folks. And here's the reason why. You're the cream of the crop. You're the absolute, I feel far away from y'all. Can I, camera people, can I, I'm just gonna come down there. Is that all right? I said, is that okay? because that stage might have some weight restrictions. <laughs> oh, y'all look lovely. Hi there. She's looking at me like, please don't hurt me, sir. <laughs> How you doing, ma'am? You look good, Aggie colors. N n are you going to A&M? Okay, that's okay. There are a lot of good schools, aren't there? Hi, sweetheart. You have freckles. When I was a kid, I wanted freckles. God made me a chocolate chip, but I wanted freckles. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, honey, how are you? Nice to see you, where are you from? What part of Texas? Here, Amarillo. Was it a long bus trip? <laughs> Hi, how are you? I like your haircut, you're looking cool. I got one too, cuz, there you go. How are you? I'm good. good. See, you know why I'm doing this, folks? So you don't, oh wait, hold on. So you don't go to sleep, but hold on, homie is waving me over here. Hold on one second. Oh, you were just saying hi. Hey. <laughs> What's your name? Madison, it's nice to meet you. I love this group. But I do this because there is the possibility that you might doze off. And I don't want you to doze off. Right, Matt? Which one's Madison? Oh, there you go. Got the wrong role. I don't want y'all to doze off. And so I really, really want to enjoy this moment with y'all. I've so looked forward to being here. I love the American Quarter Horse Association, girl. You got the coolest shades. Look at you, what's your name? Alexia Torda. Well, both of them are talking at the same time. What's your name? Alexia Torda. They're both talking at the same time. Are y'all twins? Oh boy. What's your name? Emily. Alexia Torda. Okay, and, and where are y'all from? Ohio. Oh. Yeah, we're both from Ohio. What part? 
I'm from Cleveland. Cleveland. Well, you win the award for the coolest shades. Yeah, we do. I hear you, y'all. Wow. <laughs> They're fun, aren't they? How are y'all? Is this the quiet part of the room right here? Here's the library right here, the quiet. This is the quiet little group right here. She's looking at me like, you big Negro, you better not hurt me. <laughs> We're good, mama. We're good. Listen. I'm only going to talk about four hours today and we'll be finished. Is that okay? Four hours. I come from a predominantly black family. I don't know if y'all can tell that or not. <laughs> and I'm an ordained minister. That is a lethal combination when it comes to time. You give Big Daddy some chicken wings, I'll talk to you all day. <laughs> But in the words of King Henry VIII, as he spoke to each of his six wives, I won't keep you long. <laughs> but I have come here thrilled because any time I have an opportunity to encourage young people toward excellence, I want to take advantage of it. I am so proud of you young folks. So proud of you. I sat back there and I just listened to some of you. And I just appreciate so much your dedication and your commitment. I want to tell you something. Packing 1,600 backpacks, you will never forget that. You bless this community. You serve this community. You know, you don't make the front pages of the paper. You don't get on CNN. But you did something that advances citizenship by helping people. I'm so proud of you all. Really am proud of y'all. So yes, yes. Are y'all going to Hawaii next year? Cause I'm gonna tell you something, Amarillo's nice, <laughs> but y'all need to invite Big Daddy to Hawaii. So I, I need some sun, you know what I'm saying, baby girl? <laughs> Listen, I wanna talk about making an impact to encourage you to continue being excellent. I want to make sure that at the end of my 45 minutes that you are motivated to go to an even higher level, making excellence dominant, prominent, preeminent, zenith, number one, top drawer, top, what's up girl, top shelf, central core. <laughs> Wait a minute, look at his hair. Hold on one second. Boy, what you got in there? Some Afro sheen? Woo, that's looking cool. What is your name, son? Ryan. Man, you looking cool, cat. If I had your hair, I could charge double for my engagements. Well, you got a lot of foo-foo in there, don't you, boy? Looking good, hair. I want you to make excellence number one. Nice hair, young man. You got that comb over thing, don't you? You know you're pretty, don't you? You just know you just sitting there going, hey. Hey, what's up? Yeah, I ride horses. You better believe it. <laughs> pretty boy right here. <laughs> I gotta get on track, y'all. I'm having too much fun. I need to get, we gotta be serious, right? Let, let, me, let me channel my inner white boring guy, all right? <laughs> just joking, just, just, a, just a joke. The goal is to make excellence. Everybody say, I'm listening. The goal is to make excellence the top priority. The reason why I encourage you to say, I'm listening is because for 20 years I was a professor of communication. Let me throw something on you. 50% of what you hear, you forget just like that of the remaining 50%, you lose 38% over the next 24 hours. Most of what you hear, you don't remember. I want you to really hear this because you don't wanna stay at the same level you are. And the level where you are right now is awfully good, but the goal is to get even better, to make excellence dominant, to make excellence prominent, preeminent, Zenith, number one, core, top shelf, central in your lives. Why? Because we live in a culture that values mediocrity. You all hear what I'm saying to you? We live in a culture that focuses on such silly things at the expense of every day being the best we can. You know what I hope? I hope by the end of my 45 minutes, I sound just like your grandmother. Mm-hmm. Not look like her, but sound like her. 
I hope I sound just like your grandfather because that's what we need. We need young people attending seminars like this who will go back out into the world using the Quarter Horse Association as the framework to really impact the world with excellence. That, that's the goal, to make an impact. Everybody say impact. impact. That's not good enough. That's a Lutheran level. <laughs> How many of y'all Lutherans here? Hey, I know you ain't used to noise, are you, in your church? <laughs> Great tater tot casserole, y'all. Boy, y'all can make the heck out of some green jello. I ain't lying to you. But let's get it up past the Lutheran level. Everybody say impact. I want you to feel the power of that word, young people. Listen, listen. I want you to feel the power of that word. The goal is to make an impact. Here's the problem in American culture, and guess what? I know we have friends visiting from all over the world. The world is tending to model American culture. So here's the message Western world is sending out. We don't have to make an impact. All we need to do is make a nice impression. Wrong. So, so in America... We would rather look good than be good. That's not you. I have friends in Dallas. I live in Dallas now. I have friends in Dallas. They drive Land Rovers. They don't even have any land. Mm -hmm. think, think about the incongruency in that statement. The point in American culture is to look good. Oh, yeah. Just dress it up, baby. Impress folks. Yeah. That's not you. That's not your calling. That's not why you're in this association. That's not why you've made the effort to come to Amarillo, Texas. The goal is to make an impact. An impact, what you did this morning. An impact. Everybody say impact. impact. I learned how to make an impact from the wisest man I ever met in my life. A third grade dropout. Boy, that's oxymoronic to say dropout and wisest in the same sentence. I'm talking about oxymoronic like jumbo shrimp. Like fun run. <laughs> like Microsoft works. <laughs> I used to say like country music. I know. I've been in Texas so long, I love country music now. Going to see Darius Rucker in a couple weeks. Y'all know who that is? I got a southern state of mind, baby. As a matter of fact, these days I fish, I hunt, I have cowboy boots, I have cowboy hats, I have a pickup truck. Y'all, I'm a black neck, red neck. Do you hear what I'm saying, do you? Even the library table laughed at that one. It's not oxymoronic for me to say drop out and wisest in the same sentence. Everybody say, I'm listening. I'm listening. My daddy was that person. He grew up in a little town in Texas called Huntsville. Anybody ever hear Huntsville, Texas? Grew up in Huntsville, Texas. Watch this. He had to leave school in the third grade to help out on the family farm. But just because he left school doesn't mean his education stopped. Mark Twain once said, I've never allowed my schooling to get in the way of my education. My father taught himself how to read. My, my father taught himself how to write by writing home during World War II. Listen to me, folks. Forget about the fire alarm, whatever the thing is. <laughs> hey, y'all, how you doing? Uh-oh, no smiles over here. When I get a person that's not smiling, what they're saying is, Dr. Rigsby, tell me a joke. Yeah, yeah, you're going to laugh. I'm going to make you laugh. So I was driving here today, and I accidentally ran into a car in the front of me. And a young, a, a, a person, a midget, we don't call them midgets, a little person got out and came up to my window and said, I ain't happy. And I said, well, which one are you? <laughs> She's still not laughing. I'll explain that to you later, ma'am. You don't, you don't get it? Okay, I'll explain. Seven dwarfs, anybody? Okay, anyway. All right. Yeah. My father left school in the third grade to help out on the family farm. Taught himself how to read. Taught himself how to write. Listen to this, everyone. He was born in 1920, which meant 
He was born as America was breathing the last gasp of the Civil War. Racism was de facto the way of life. Against that backdrop, my daddy decided that he was going to be a man, not a white man, not a brown man, not a black man, but a man. Let me interrupt my own story and tell you all something. We weren't allowed when I was growing up to make excuses, and here's where it started. I remember in 1972, I'm in high school, I'm a sophomore in high school, 1972, and I re I'm 61 years old, and I, I remember there was a song by James Brown back then called Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud, and we were feeling really militant, and me and my buddies came home from school once, and I was going to show off in front of my friends, and we we're singing Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud, and so I coaxed my dad, I said, Dad, tell my friends about how when you grew up in Texas, it was so bad that you'd have to get off the sidewalk to allow a man of another color to walk on the sidewalk. Calmly, without raising his voice, my daddy said, son, there's a word for that. It's called history. We live in the present. We weren't allowed to make excuses. I go all over this country saying, it's not about white, it's not about brown, it's not about black. Do I have any witnesses here? I would like to tell the world that all lives matter. Not just black lives, all lives matter. Do y'all hear what I'm saying to you? All lives matter. I learned that from a third grade dropout. We were taught, don't make excuses. Whatever you do, you do your best, you help out. And so my father goes to, to support the war. He signs up for the United States Army. Watch this. As soon as World War II is over, he comes back to his beloved state of Texas and he announces the unthinkable to his family that he's moving to a foreign country, San Francisco, California. <laughs> and if you live in Texas, you hate the 49ers just like we hate the Cowboys. But we kind of like them a little bit, last year at least. <laughs> Within the first week my father's in California, he falls in love with a forklift driver. My mother was a bad mama jamma, let me tell you right now, baby. <laughs> Didn't need a man. He was just convenient. For you young folks that may not know, during World War times, women would hold jobs traditionally held by men. My mother drove a forklift at an arsenal that supplied the weaponry to support World War II. My mom and dad meet. They court. They get married. I'm the oldest of the lot. Watch this. Here it comes. My daddy gets a job as a cook. A cook. At the height of his career, he's making $500 a month. By the way, let me interrupt my own speech. One of the first lessons I learned, son, it's not how much you make that makes you wealthy. It's how much you save. Because based on how much you save determines your leveraging power. It's how much you save. Young folks, get in the habit of saving. If you haven't already, get, even if it's just $10 a week or $10 a month, get in the habit of saving. Get in the habit of saving young in your life. So my dad gets this job as a cook at California Maritime Academy. For those of you that live in Texas, we have a Maritime Academy in Galveston. When you graduate from this college, you become ocean liner pilots and tugboat captains. You work for port authorities. You're in the maritime business. These are those men and women that are on long haul barges from China to San Francisco. In order for these midshipmen to graduate, they have to go to sea three months out of every year, the worst weather months on the nautical calendar. Here's the bottom line. This third grade dropout from rural Texas in a 30-year career as a cook sails the world 10 times over, learns five foreign languages. I want you to listen to what he taught his children about excellence about how to make an impact. The greatest influences in my life, a country mama from Oklahoma and a third grade father. My mother was quoting Henry Ford, who would often say, if you think you can or if you think you can't, you're right. So why not think you can? I got a third grade dropout daddy quoting Michelangelo, who would say to us, boys, yes daddy, I'm not going to have a problem if you aim high and miss, but I'm going to have a real issue if you aim low and hit. How many of you know we live in a society that aims lower and lower and lower and then blames everybody else?
for their own laziness, slothfulness, and, and unwillingness to grow. Not this group. To whom much is given, much is required. The goal is to make an impact. It's not to stay at the same level that you are right now. If you are satisfied in staying at this same level, guess what's going on? Entropy is taking place. Somebody raise your hand if you can give me the definition of entropy. Oh, let me put some cash in it. Hold on. Let me see. Let me see if I can do it. I got a hundred of fifty for one dollar. <laughs> give me the definition of entropy. Hold on. Okay, I don't think I have I might not have this right, but it's um, gradual decay, right? That's good enough for me, buddy. Let me add a few more. What's your name? Uh, Paul. Paul, way to go, Paul. Actually, you you're right, you're right on the money. I'm just gonna add a few more words to gradual decay. I need everybody listening. Entropy. The second law of thermodynamics that suggests anything made up of a physical matter is in the process of decay and eventual chaos. What are you saying to us, Dr. Rick? If you're not going forward, you're not remaining stagnant. You're going backwards. And our world doesn't understand that. Guess why, y'all? Because we're so obsessed with what we look like and what we sound like and where we live and what we have and what we drive and who our friends are and what our titles are and what our status is. That it's entirely possible to visit Amarillo and not realize that there are 1,600 people who need their backpacks filled. I love this association. I'm so proud of you folks, but don't let it end here. Everything you do ought to be seasoned with the salt of excellence. I want you to listen to these lessons I learned from a third grade dropout. Yes, being a PhD required work, but I'm going to tell you something. It was because of a mother and father. My little brother Bobby was so spoiled, but he got it. Today, Bobby is the Honorable Robert Ray Rigsby, Superior Court Judge, District of Columbia. Yeah. If you have a mother and father that don't tolerate excuses, get on your knees and thank God for them. If you have a mother and father that demand excellence, get on your knees and thank God for them. Because one day, and you might not see it now, you will be so grateful as you're a shining example of excellence for the world to see. I, I didn't see it at 18, but I sure see it at 61. I remember I came home huffy one day from my job at Jack in the Box. Y'all know what huffy means? Had a bad attitude. My attitude sucked. You, you understand what I'm saying now? Yeah. Y'all ever had that problem? Just keep looking straight ahead like I'm not talking to you, lady. <laughs> came home huffy. My father, I'm 16. Translation, I know everything. I got to figure it out. I got some hair under my arms. I know what I'm talking about, baby. Hmm, yeah, even would walk like this. Hey, what's up? That ain't even a sentence. Anyway, come home, Huffy. My father said, son, what's wrong with you? Watch this, everybody look up. Everybody say I'm listening. I'm mad, daddy. Why are you mad, son? Daddy, I'm making minimum wage, but they're treating me like a slave at Jack in the Box. What? I only make $1.65 an hour. That was minimum wage in 1972. Don't complain about whatever you make. I know. True story, man. $1.65. But you could, get, you could get two cheeseburgers and an order of fries and a chocolate shake for like 50 cents. So it worked out. Why are you mad? That white man over there told me I had to clean the gutters. I don't clean gutters. I fry french fries. My father said, are you serious, son? I said, yes, sir, daddy. He said, let me ask you a question. Who signs your paycheck? I could tell this was not going to go the way I thought it was going to go. I said, Floyd Madison. He said, son, that's your boss, right? I didn't ask you what his skin color was. I said, that's your boss, right? Yes, sir. Son, as long as that man signs your paycheck, Listen to me, young folks. Listen to me. You do whatever he tells you to do. When you own your own restaurant, you do whatever you want. Watch this. Now, leave your car in the driveway. Walk back to Jack in the Box. Tell Mr. Madison that you're honored 
to volunteer for an eight hour shift, unpaid, and all you'd want to do is scrub toilets and gutters. And when I see Mr. Madison later in the week, he better tell me that you were the best toilet scrubbing brother he's ever seen in his life. That's what I'm talking about, young folks. I didn't get it then. I was mad and resentful then. Guess what? So appreciated now. My youngest is 16. A couple months ago, I told him, I said, Joshy, I need you to go up and scrub your toilet, clean your toilet. You ain't gonna believe what this boy said to me. First of all, young people, don't ever say this to your parents. How much you gonna pay me? I'm gonna give you another day to live. That's what, that's your pay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So guess what this boy said to me? He said, Daddy, the maid is coming next Tuesday. I said, Josh, I didn't ask you when the maid was coming. I know when the maid's coming. But if you don't know how to scrub a toilet, watch this. If you don't know how to scrub a toilet with excellence, I'm going to have to apologize to your wife for giving her a boy. If you don't know how to scrub a toilet with excellence, I'm going to have to apologize to your employer for giving her a boy. You are what you repeatedly do. Therefore, excellence ought to be a habit, a habit, a habit, a habit, a habit, a habit, not an act. We learned that growing up in my family. We learned that. Listen to these lessons from a third grade dropout. Son, this is what we learn with regard to making an impact. Son, you really want to make an impact every day? Don't judge people. I'm thinking, what? I didn't say that out loud. Watch this. Stay focused. Boy, I've been all over the world. I've seen good and bad in every shade. Guess what we tend to do? We tend to look at the outside of a person and judge them. Thus, we determine who we're going to impact. That's not a great person. As a matter of fact, hang in there. Get to know the person. Rise to the challenge that's right in front of you. But don't judge them based on their hair or their sex or what they drive. Hey, look up. How many of you have ever been surprised by somebody you prejudged and they turned out to be a very different person than you thought? Raise your hands. Look at there. Me too. Me too. About 15 years ago, I, I had a prejudice moment. I got on an airplane. I looked to the left into the cockpit and I saw a woman in the pilot seat. Don't judge me. I said, don't judge me. I had to have a come to Jesus meeting. Because guess what my first thought was? She can't handle this jumbo jet. How stupid. Which tells you that prejudice is rooted in ignorance. Don't judge a man just because of the color of his skin. Don't you dare judge a man because of what he chooses to do for an occupation. Extend your hand, look in his eyes, and get to know somebody that's different from you. That's what my father was saying. And then he dropped Jonathan Swift on me, who said on one occasion, vision is the ability to see the invisible. The goal is to impact. The goal is to grow your influence. Young folks, how do you grow your influence? Turn around and look at me. How do you grow your influence? It was John Maxwell who said, influence is leadership. Listen to me carefully. Leadership is influence. Your ability to influence people within the sphere of your periphery will determine the impact that you make. In other words, young man, if you're telling the truth, thinking the best of people, doing what you say you're going to do, and not judging, your influence has just grown. You impact people all around you. You hear what I'm saying, y'all? That's the goal. Don't judge. Everybody say, don't judge. don't judge. That's not good enough. Everybody say, don't judge. Don't judge. A lot of times you have to evaluate, but don't judge people. I got to tell you all a story. Sorry, sir. I didn't mean to do that, Mr. Microphone, man. I hope he doesn't have a gun. I need to tell you all a story. I had an engagement at the Ritz-Carlton San Francisco, Knob Hill. That translates old money, old money San Francisco. My job, watch this, look up everybody. My job was to go in, evaluate undercover, then give a speech to the same employees that I'm evaluating. I drove up in a beautiful black sports car. Actually, it was a sedan. It was a Mercedes Benz. I happen to be black. I don't know if y'all noticed that. The valet shirt certainly did. Guess what the first... And he had no idea who was speaking the next day. Guess what the first word... Would y'all like to hear what the first word... Would anybody like to hear what the first... Guess what the first words were out of his mouth. Thank you.
Sir, who are you here to pick up? I have a question for y'all. Do you think he was racist or prejudiced? Prejudice. I got to talk to the gentleman. I, we had a great conversation. Helped him, and boy, was he shocked when I showed up on stage a day later. He wasn't racist. He was just ignorant. That fuels prejudice. Don't judge a person because she has blonde hair. Hang in there and get to know her. Spend some time and get to know her. That's what that third grade dropout was saying. Why is that, Dad? Because, son, how can you impact somebody that you've already judged? You've already con you know what one of my favorite sermons is to preach in church? The um, Jesus meets a woman at a well and talks to her. He's a Jew. She's a Samaritan. That would be like the Black Panther Party meeting the Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> it ain't going to be good. <laughs> Check out the disciples. What I told my congregation is that we're the disciples. The disciples take one look at the woman. Because of her ethnicity, they keep walking. Translation, eh, she has no eternal significance. Don't judge. Tell me more, Dad. I want to grow my influence. I want to be the best leader I can be. I want to move beyond the chains and shackles of just looking cute. I want to impact people. Tell me more. Son, you really want to do that? Show up early. Son, you'd rather be an hour early than a minute late. How many of you show up on time? Raise your hands. I want you to stop showing up on time. I want you to stop showing up on time. Showing up on time is like offering customer service. It stinks. I want you to start showing up early. I want you to start offering customer excellence. Look up. Show up early. But my friends don't show up early in school. You're not your friends. But I, the class starts at 9.10. I want to be there. and I, Be there at 9.05. Be the first one there. It sends a message. It says you value this opportunity. It says that you come ready. You come prepared. Can I tell y'all something? How you do anything is how you do everything. You're not kidding. You're not getting it. We had a wide receiver at AM. This fool goes out with a girl and steals her credit card. Are y'all hearing me? When he gets reinstated back to the team, the wide receivers are supposed to run 10 yard routes. He runs seven, he runs eight, throws the whole offense off. What's your point, Dr. Rick? How you do anything is how you do everything. So if you get in the habit of just showing up whenever you want to, <laughs> we just show up whenever it's convenient for you. <laughs> when it's all about you, because you're a prima donna. <laughs> it's just whenever I want to show up. Because the world revolves around me because my daddy told me so. <laughs> Grow up! Can I throw something on y'all? Great people do things that other people don't. Don't ever forget that. Great people do things that other people don't. They're always asking themselves, what can I do to get better, Brock? Great people. You're on a plane. You don't want, you don't want a C student as your pilot if the C was in aviation. You want a Sully Sullenberger. Birds have hit the engines. I got to put this bad boy down. There's a Hudson River. You, go, you, you gotta have surgery? You don't want a doctor saying, you know what, I was a mediocre student in medical school, but uh, I'm gonna try to wake you up. <laughs> Great people are always asking themselves, how can I grow, how can I get better? Look up, everybody. Here's one simple chore every day. Start showing up early. It will change your life. Change mine. My dad had the breakfast, the lunch shift, five o'clock to one. Had to be at California Maritime Academy at 5 in the morning. The academy was 15 minutes from our house. What time did he have to be at work? How far was the academy from our house? My mother said for 30 years he left at 3.45 in the morning. My mother said, Daddy, why do you leave so early? Listen to his answer, young leaders. Don't ever forget this. My daddy said, I leave early because maybe one day one of my boys will catch me in the act of excellence. Hold that thought. Harvard Business Review, September 2004. The article is titled Deep Smarts. Here's the thesis. Lecturing, what our high schools and middle schools and universities are based upon, is the worst kind of teaching method. 
that if you want to get the intended message across, model the behavior. What do you model when you're showing up on time? You're modeling, look, pay attention, young lady. You're modeling mediocrity. You're modeling I don't really care. You're modeling it's more about me than about anybody else. Look up. You want to change your life? You want to grow your influence? From this day forward, start showing up early. How many of y'all show up early as a habit? Raise your hands. I love that. I love that. It'll change your life. How many of you know there were two flights into Amarillo this morning? I don't want to take a chance. So I flew in last night. I live in Dallas. I understand storm systems. I understand delays. What if I'm not here at 1115? There was one, one flight that got in at 10 this morning, too tight. I hear with a piercing familiarity, son, you'd rather be an hour early than a minute late. It'll grow your influence. Tell me more, dad. Son, be kind to people. Just be kind. What's happened to manners, young folks? What's happened to manners? They're gone. Do you know that when I was a kid, being kind was a value? Today, it's a commodity that we barter to get what we think we might need. So we play situational kindness. So if important people are around, we'll be kind. That's not what a leader does. Not a leader who makes an impact. You're kind all the time. You're kind all the time. Be kind, folks. Practice kindness. What, what does that look like, Dr. Rigsby? If you go into a bathroom and there's a paper towel on the floor, pick it up. Oh, that's beneath me. That's why they got soap. Mm -hmm. If somebody's trying to get over in your lane, don't speed up. Just keep looking straight ahead like I'm not talking to you. <laughs> Slow down. But it'll add a second to my travel time. Be kind. Hold the door. Be kind. Take them all. How many of y'all have ever heard of George Washington Carver? Forget the sweet potatoes. Forget the peanuts. George Washington Carver said, when common people do common things in uncommon ways, they command the attention of the world. I just described your grandmother, didn't I? When common people do common things in uncommon ways, the world stops. Be kind to people. I get to do a lot of NFL chapels. You see a lot of things with professional football players. You see guys that can run the 40 uh, in record time and they're, they're big as J.J. Watt. You see guys that, that are maybe the, the, just a little bit bigger than you, young man, but they can bench press 250 pounds 25 times. But the thing that stops me in my tracks every time is when I see one of those rich, look, look at me, gladiators show kindness. You folks are in an elite class. There are eyes on you everywhere you go. Take advantage of it. Lead the world in being kind. Do you have any idea the power a kind leader has over a leader who is not kind? Be kind to folks. And let it start in your home. How do I do that, Dr. Rigsby? I don't like my brothers and sisters. Serve them. Take one week and don't complain one time. Look at me. You want to be kind? Here's a challenge. When you get home for one week, don't, don't have one complaining word. Don't say one negative thing. Not one. Try it for a week. Then try it for two days. Kindness is a habit. Tell me more, Dad. This one changed my life. Son, make sure your servant's towel is bigger than your ego. How many of you young folks already know that ego stops forward progress? That ego is the anesthesia that deadens the pain of stupidity. Well, there's a hallmark moment right now. You might want to write that one. Ego is the anesthesia that deadens the pain of stupidity. Pride is the burden of a foolish person. Make sure, make sure that it's not about you, but it's about serving. It's about what you did this morning. Look up, everybody. I want to give you three words. I'm going to say them, and I want you to repeat them. Are you ready? If you're ready, say, I'm ready. I'm ready. A bowl. A bowl. A borg. A borg. And a broom. Here's my point. Make sure your servant's towel, my father said, is always out. Make sure it's bigger than your ego, your own sense of me, myself, and I. First, a bowl. My father was a simple cook. But he taught me how to be a servant. And he taught me that one of the things that servants do is that they pay attention to the little things. Are you all with me? I really need you all to listen to this. I'm just about done. I need you to look up and listen. Let me interrupt my own example and tell you that a famous football coach, former coach, 
for the Pittsburgh Steelers named Chuck Knoll said this. You got to really hear me, young people. He said that champions are champions. Let me translate that. Great leaders are great leaders. Not because they do extraordinary things all the time, but because they do ordinary things better than everyone else. Don't ever forget that. There will always be people smarter than you. Always be people sharper than you. There will always be people more talented than you. But don't you ever let anybody outwork you. And in the process, excellence will come forth. A bowl. Son, pay attention to the basics. Yes, Daddy. What does that mean, Daddy? When you go into a restaurant, have them pour some soup in the bowl. Sample the soup. If the soup is not good, don't invest in the restaurant. Little things. A Borg, as in Bjorn Borg, a former tennis player. I had a friend that played professional tennis against Bjorn Borg. He said, Bjorn Borg in the 70s was his toughest opponent. I said, why? And my friend said, because he wore everybody out. He had his basics so down. A broom. Get any book you can written by or about a former basketball coach named John Wooden, who won a lot of national championships. But guess what he was found doing during the week? This is an NCAA Division I national championship coach. Every week he would go into the cupboard, he'd get a push broom, and he was caught sweeping his own gym floor. You want to make an impact? Go find your broom. You want to make an impact? Pay attention to the Borg in your life. What are the basics? For me, it's telling the truth. It's thinking the best of people. It's doing what I say I'm going to do. You want to make an impact? Pay attention to that bowl and what's in it, the soup. The goal is to outserve everybody else. That's why I'm so proud of you folks and what you did today. Let me give you one last one, and I'll let you go. Son, you want to be a great leader? Yes, Daddy. You want to grow your influence globally? Yes, sir. Don't ever forget this, son. If you're going to do a job, do it right. I know it ought to be do it well grammatically, but I like that old school. I'm thinking about a boy in Los Angeles. All he wanted to do was play Little League Baseball. His mother couldn't even afford to buy him a glove. He goes into the cupboard and gets a paper bag, paper bag, and fashions it into a glove. Gets a tennis ball and throws a tennis ball against the back wall of his projects. When he plays Little League, he's good. I mean, he's so good that he gets a scholarship to a great ag school, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. He's so good, he gets drafted by the San Diego Padres baseball team. He's so good, he helps the St. Louis Cardinals win a World Series. What are you saying, Dr. Rick? Twelve years ago when Ozzie Smith walked into the Hall of Fame, he said during his induction speech, and I quote word for word this portion, all my life I've been told what I could not do, but I decided to pursue excellence and I was guided by one motto. Good enough isn't good enough if it can be better. Better isn't good enough if it can be best. Good enough isn't good enough if it can be better. Better isn't good enough if it can be best. Good enough isn't good enough if it can be better. Better isn't good enough if it can be best. Dr. Rigsby, what are you telling us with these lines? Like, how you do anything is how you do everything. Like, you are what you repeatedly do. Therefore, excellence ought to be a habit, not an act. Like, good enough isn't good enough if it can be better. Better isn't good enough if it can be best. What is your motive? To get you to go to the next level. To never, ever be satisfied with where you are. Because great people are not. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Great people are never said. There's a hunger. There's a burning. They do the ordinary things better than anybody else. They're always paying attention. They're always growing. Little things like showing up early, honoring their mother and their father. They might not always agree with them, but they know and understand honor because they understand authority. Great people are always growing, young folks. They're always growing. Don't ever forget that. The majority of people that are your colleagues, 
listen to me, that are your friends, that are your contemporaries, where are they today? Happy to wallow in mediocrity. Look up, but you're going someplace. Act like it. You've got a vision. Act like it. You have a destiny. Act like it. What do you mean, Dr. Grigsby? You show up early. You don't slumber and sleep. You reserve leisure for just those times. Forward momentum in every area of your life. You don't accept slothfulness or laziness or mediocrity whatsoever. And when the fun times come, boy, they're going to be fun. But you are making an impact. You're making an impact. You're making an impact. Not just an impression.